uh, prayer and fasting. So yes, I'm breaking off from the Life of Christ series. We shall return to this series next year, God willing. Um, I've been going through it the entire year, and, and the Lord has been very gracious to us. He has helped us to know Jesus more and to understand him more. But I'd like us to think together about this matter of prayer and fasting. Our gracious Father, thank you for the testimony of Ruth. Thank you for the testimonies of other people who she represents for the days of prayer that we had with fasting. Some fasted for some days, others for all the days. We are really grateful for the refreshing that you've brought to us. As we approach this subject today, I pray that you would teach us wondrous things out of your law. I pray that your spirit who is among us today, for your presence which is always with us, with your people wherever they are, would stir in our hearts a renewed hunger and thirst for righteousness and for the things of prayer and would give us a right biblical understanding of what fasting is. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So concerning prayer and fasting, that is, that is the subject which I am talking about today. Um, as I've said just now, some of you prayed for all the 21 days. Maybe you forgot to pray some of the days. Um, some of you fasted all the days. Some of you fasted one or two days. But why? Why do we pray and why do we fast? Especially why do we fast? Doesn't God just hear our prayers when we pray? And furthermore, we don't see Jesus or know his disciples commanding anyone to fast. So Martin, why are you telling us to fast and pray? That question has been asked to me several times. Uh, if it was even asked during this time of prayer and fasting, why should I fast? Or else I can just pray and the Lord will hear and will answer my prayer. So I thought to take a few minutes and bring a biblical understanding to prayer and fasting so that we would think about it together as a church so that you would go meditating upon it when you go back home or you would think about it next time when you are thinking of, of fasting. So there are four things that I will say today. There are many sub points under it, under them, but there are basically four things concerning prayer and fasting. First of all, just shortly looking at what prayer is, what, what is prayer? And then secondly, what does the Bible say about this subject of especially fasting, but also prayer? Thirdly, why should you fast? Why? And fourth, when? you should fast, when you should fast. So this is the progression which we shall take for the next few minutes. So please follow with me. I don't have any particular text to read, but there are biblical texts that will be uh, projected on the television. So first of all then, what is prayer? Sounds so simple. Maybe you are, you are, your children have asked you what prayer is. Maybe a friend has asked you what prayer is. A husband, a wife has asked you what prayer is. And um, it is one of those simple words that can be very complicated to define. For example, when someone asks you something like, what is a line, L-I-N-E? And you think, I, I know what a line is, but how do I define what a line is? Is it a connection of dots? Is it one continuous dot that makes a line? Or what is a line? How do I define it? How do we define what prayer is? Well... Ten descriptions that I have listed here will help us with our understanding of what prayer is, of what is prayer. So follow with me as we go through each one of them to try and understand what is prayer. First of all, prayer is dependence on God. It's dependence on God. And this is why the power is always not in prayer. My prayers, your prayers, there's no power in your prayers. The power is in God. It is invested in God. The dependence is on him. Unless he answers whatever prayers we make, our prayers are not powerful. So prayer, first of all, is dependence on God, and the power is in God who you pray to. But prayer is also 
communication with God, talking with God, conversing with God. When you love someone, you naturally converse with them. You have a conversation with them. Things that I'm saying today, some of them may be very rudimentary, very elementary. You know them perhaps, and you may relearn about them today. You don't know them and you may learn. Maybe you have some misconceptions and you'll be able to unlearn. It's as simple as prayer is communication with God. But prayer is also, thirdly, communion with God. Communion with God. It is much more than asking, much more than seeking, much more than knocking. Every time I read the descendants of Adam in Genesis chapter 5, and then from all the way from, from, from Adam finishing to Japheth, or, or Noah who had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, in verse 24 you come to Enoch. And, and something special is explained to us about Enoch. Enoch lived for 365 years. And we are told that Enoch walked with God until he was no more. Maybe some of you like to walk in parks, like botanical gardens at Entebbe. So imagine this entire world was a park, and you spent your entire life walking through it. But you are not alone, you are walking with God. Surely, you have to do more than just asking, or seeking, or knocking. You have to commune with this person that you are walking with. It's how I imagine Enoch walking with the Lord. Or what about Jesus? He would, he would retreat to solitary places and spend entire nights with his master in prayer. Surely he did much more than asking. There was a communion with God. Prayer is also a spiritual discipline. It's one among the many spiritual disciplines. It doesn't come easily. It is cultivated, develop muscles and stamina for it. What is prayer, number five? Prayer is, it is spiritual warfare. If you didn't know, you should know you have an enemy. You have an adversary. You have an opposer. And his name is Satan. His name is the devil. He opposes you. And so prayer is a, is a spiritual, non-carnal weapon in our arsenal that God has given us to be able to fight against the devious and evil strategies of the devil. The Bible calls it the wiles of the devil. Satan will do everything and anything to keep you from prayer. You know that. Whatever it takes, it doesn't matter. He will use, your, he will use the world and the flesh. And even sometimes good things. You, you want to go and pray, and, and then you remember, oh, I didn't text so-and-so. I didn't write such and such a reminder. Uh, let me first read the word of God before I pray. I haven't even looked at my devotion, by the way. Um, uh, there's something, let me check whether my children are sleeping okay. Let me do this and the other. There's always something he will distract your mind to do other than at that instant spend time in prayer. So there's a spiritual warfare there. And when you talk about prayer, it is spiritual warfare. Prayer is also an expression of an, an inbuilt, inward desire that we have. You know, like the way you desire food when you're hungry, as Daryl was saying, or something to drink when you're thirsty. The, the desire is simply there. Just as a newborn baby, when the baby is born naturally, he or she wants to drink his, uh, wants to drink his or her mother's milk. It's so natural. Nobody teaches the baby. Nobody trains the baby. But the baby knows how to suck as a newborn baby. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So we are told in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. So it's an inbuilt, inward desire. What about Saul before he was converted to Paul? And immediately he was converted and Ananias was told, go and look for that man. Ananias is told, arise Go, you will find him. He is doing what? He is praying. Who taught Paul to pray? That was so sudden. He was converted and immediately he is praying. It is an expression of an, an inward, internal, inbuilt desire. Prayer is supplication. This is number seven. It's supplication. Uh, and this is likely 90% the content of your prayers, of my prayers. It's petition. It's telling God, this is what I want this is what I am asking for. It's supplication. Number eight, prayer is simple yet very difficult, as I explained a while ago. And it's because generally we complicate it. We make it, we make it hard. 
Sometimes you are driving or, or walking or working and you remember something that you, you feel you need to pray about and you think, uh, I will wait to pray in the evening. Or um, uh, I can pray another time. Let me, okay, I'll wait for a dedicated time of prayer. It is simple as at that point just saying, Father, I pray that you would save my son. The prayer is done. It's over. It's as simple as meeting a church member here on Sunday and they tell you, please pray for me regarding this and the other. And you just bow your head and pray for them for 30 seconds, 20 seconds, one minute, and it's done. But sometimes it appears very difficult, yet it is very simple. Number nine is that prayer is commanded by God. It's actually a commandment. If you're not praying, you're sinning. Prayer is a commandment. And lastly, number 10, prayer is sufficient without fasting. Hence why I started from. If you just pray, the Lord hears and answers your prayers, hears and answers my prayers, even without having to set aside time to stay away without food. While prayer is clearly commanded, fasting is never commanded, but it is expected. It is expected. It is a rather personal because of some pressing need. So we have some liberty regarding fasting. It is left at your discretion, at my discretion. And you see the wisdom of God because... So, say somebody is poor, for example. They have no money. Sometimes they even go without food. Surely you are telling this person to be fasting, and it's a commandment. In a way, they already fast, but not for the purposes of spirituality. But they go without food for long periods. Maybe they have just one meal in a day. Or somebody who is sick. They have an illness. They are in hospital. They need food to sustain them, to enable them to get healed. And it's a continuous illness which doesn't end. So if God commands this, how, how shall these categories of people be able to fulfill this commandment to fast? But to pray, you can pray whether you are sick or poor. So prayer is commanded. Fasting is expected. So then the question is, why, why fast when prayer is sufficient? Right? Why, why should I fast? Let me, just, let me just pray and God will hear my prayers. I don't have to spend all of this time fasting and going hungry. So there are two extreme views about fasting. Two extreme views regarding fasting. The first one is that we fast to earn worthiness before God. To earn some merit before God. Um, to get some marks, some points, some thank you points from God for fasting. Some people go to that extreme. So you think, when I fast, God will fill in the blank. He will have to, whatever it is. The other extreme view is, since it is not uh, commanded, a commanded regular part of the life of the church, it has no benefit. It is of little usefulness. It is of little value. Um, I think I'm just okay, actually, just, just praying. So two extremes. You can either overdo it, you can either undo it. So we want to think, what does the Bible say? What is the biblical understanding that we should have regarding fasting? What does the Bible explain to us concerning fasting, the whole issue of, of staying without food? The Bible is the standard for all matters of faith and practice. The Bible is our rule, it is our guide, it is not me, it is not you, it is not anyone. The Word of God has the final authority in the life of the Christian. What does the Bible say regarding fasting? Eight things. Number one, Jesus expected it of his disciples. We saw this in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus expected it of his disciples and I've already said it before. His criticism of the religious leaders in his day was not doing it, but how they did it. They fasted to be seen by people. They fasted because of people, not because of God. It was not the fasting that Jesus was criticizing. It was how the fasting was done. The fasting should be in secret, Jesus tells us in those verses. It should be in private between a child and his father. Between you, the Son of God, the daughter of God, and your heavenly Father. And he sees your fasting, which is done in private, and blesses you. The motive and intention of the heart must be proper and correct. And there should be no change of external behavior when one is fasting. If you like to put on makeup, regular days of your life, wake up and put on makeup. If you like to 
comb your hair, comb your hair. If you like to wear your glasses, wear your glasses. If you prefer to stay with your mask on the whole day, stay with your mask on the whole day. Don't change your external behavior. It's right fasting, Jesus told us. And then, um, number two, clicker, do the clicking. Okay, there it is. Number two is that biblical fasting is staying away from food. Not other things, not uh, television, not someone, not entertainment. <laughs> uh, people put all manner of things. Biblical fasting is staying away from food. The word itself that is translated fast means to abstain from eating. So that's the second thing that we need to know about fasting. The Bible says the third thing in the Old Testament, people fasted very frequently, very regularly for all manner of things. Surely there, there has to be a value to it if all of these people fasted. If David, if Daniel, if Abraham, if Jeremiah, if all manner of saints in the Old Testament took time to stay without food for spiritual purposes, there is value and benefit in fasting. Number four, Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights before he embarked on his public ministry. That is a very, very challenging fast if you think about it. As Daryl rightly said, you go without food for a few hours and you feel as if you haven't been eating for days. So 40 days, 40 nights, no food, no water. It's very challenging. Some people do a 40-night 40 40 fast but they eat or drink in between, maybe one meal a day or some drinks during the day. Fifth thing that the Bible says about fasting is the early church regularly fasted. It was common practice for the church to, to, to regularly fast, to stay without food. And their fasting included prayer. The fasting included prayer. For example, in Acts chapter 13, we are told that as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, separate from me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Before they, obtained el they ordained elders in Acts chapter 14, we read that they fasted. So it was a practice that was there in the early church. In the days after Jesus ascended to heaven, the early church regularly fasted. What about we today, definitely we should fast. Uh, what does the Bible say about fasting? Number six is that, um, have I passed it? Yeah, the Bible regularly connects prayer and fasting. It puts prayer and fasting together. In fact, you always look where people fasted, there was always prayer. It was not just a hunger strike or a staying away from food. It was staying away from food so that you can devote more time to prayer, so that you can devote your affections and, and your time and whatever other means you have to God. So prayer was always connected with fasting. We've already seen that from Acts 13 and Acts 14. From, Acts, from Luke chapter 2, we see that that prophetess, Anna, Night and day, she never ceased calling on the Lord. She called on the Lord night and day with fastings and prayers. See how it is put in the plural, with fastings and prayers, night and day. So that's what the Bible says about fasting. That's the sixth thing. The seventh thing is that Jesus' teaching on the subject mostly was to restore proper fasting and correct improper attitudes and practice during fasting. It was corrective. He, would, he was teaching to say, this is not the right way to fast. This is not the right way to go about this spiritual discipline. The right way to go about it is this. Jesus is interested at the heart, at the intentions, at the motives of our hearts. And he only can see them. Only he can see our hearts. Our friends can't, our husbands can't, our children can't, but... Jesus can see them. And that's why in Matthew chapter 6, he says that you appear not to, unto men to fast, but unto your Father who is in secret, and your Father who is in secret shall reward you openly. The Pharisee in Luke chapter 18 said, I fast twice in a week. Imagine that. How often do you fast? This guy fasted. The Pharisees fasted two times in a week. I thought this is remarkable to be able to spend that time 
away from food for the purposes of spiritual nourishment and spiritual care. Not only that, but he said he gives tithes of all that he possesses. Of everything that he possesses, he's able to give tithes. Whatever the tithe may look to you, 5%, 10%, 15%, 20%, 25%. In the Old Testament, the tithes were somewhere between 20 to 28%. So if you want to be legalistic about a percentage and you give 10%, you would find it very challenging if you look at the tithes that they were commanded to give in the Old Testament. And the New Testament, we are left to our own desires about giving, which should be big desires. Give willingly, give gladly, give cheerfully, not without compulsion. Not with compulsion, sorry. Not with manipulation or coercion. Each one should give what they have purposed in their own heart. 5%, 10%, 15%, 20%, 35%, for God loves a cheerful giver. This guy, this man, gave tithes of all that he possesses. Jesus commends humility. Is what he does. Not hypocrisy. Being secretive, not showing off. So he's, whenever you find Jesus teaching about fasting, it was corrective. Uh, it was to restore proper fasting and correct improper ways of fasting. Lastly, on what does the Bible say, number eight, the disciples of John and even of the Pharisees, they fasted often. They came to Jesus and asked him, how come the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples don't fast? And Jesus tells them, listen, you only fast when the bridegroom is not there. I mean, if you have God with you day in, day out, as they had Jesus with them day in, day out, why fast? Whatever you want to ask, the biggest, the most impossible thing you can imagine, you can ask Jesus. He is right there with you. But now he's taken away. This is appropriate time for fasting. He's not with us uh, physically. He's with us spiritually. And one day we shall be with him. So this is really good time to be fasting. Now that the bridegroom is away, the bride fasts. Now that we, the church, Christ's bride, is absent from him, fasting is fitting. So for these eight reasons, is what the Bible says about fasting. About fasting. Now then, why? Why? You ask me, the question is always why. Why should I fast? Why should I take time to fast and take time not to eat food? Um, for the purposes of prayer, why should I deny myself the luxuries and the pleasures of life that I enjoy so much as a Christian? Why should you fast? Well, first of all, for self-control and discipline. Every time that you fast, that I fast, you're probably reminded of that. It's easy to say the fruit of the Spirit is da -da 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 and self-control. Now try it when you go without food for a number of hours uh, and you're used to getting a cup of tea uh, or a cup of coffee or a glass of fresh juice or you have a breakfast and mid-morning tea, you have lunch and uh, evening tea and supper and, and maybe snacks in between. Try and go through a day without that and you find, oh, my self-control, my discipline is not what it should be, but fasting stretches those muscles of self-control and discipline. It keeps the body in its place. It is saying by the Holy Spirit's enablement, I'm going to worship God in my inner being even when I am weak in my body. That's one reason why you should fast. Second reason is in preparation to intentionally clear the way for prayer by laying aside weight and, and, and fight sin more intensively. You know, maybe you're going through an intense time of prayer. You say, I will dedicate a few days to fast. In preparation, in preparing my heart for this, it is Hebrews chapter 12 where we are told, Therefore, therefore, seeing that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and every sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Looking unto who? Looking unto Jesus the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, he scorned its shame, and he's now seated at the right hand of the throne of God in heaven. So to intentionally prepare our heart for prayer, for prayer, we, we fast, we go without food. Number three, why you should fast? A clicker, do your thing. Okay, did I switch it off? 
Okay, why you should fast? To disconnect with, with pleasures, to disconnect with luxuries and comforts that keep you from praying. And, and, and those are very many. I think the biggest one today has to be entertainment, has to be the internet. Maybe we should blame electricity, because when electricity is switched off, everyone's head now goes up and people start talking to one another. Electricity is really the boss, isn't it? It is not Wi-Fi, it is not Zuku or uh, MTN or Airtel, it is Umeme. Once they switch it off, you are done, my friend. You may stay for a few hours with your phone charged, but after that it will just go off. So fasting enables you to be disconnected from those pleasures of life that we enjoy so much. Number four, we should fast to stay away from the smaller blessings of God so that we can receive greater blessings of God. Smaller blessings such as food, such as drinks, such as water. These are blessings from God that we have food to eat, right? Now, fasting enables us to say, you know, these are smaller. They are greater blessings, such as spending time with the Lord, such as fellowship with the Lord, such as communion with my Lord and my Savior, meaningful fellowship, deeper, closer, fruitful union and communion with God. I'm laying this aside, the lesser, so that I may attain the greater. Fasting, number five, why you should fast, is to intensify prayer. Sorry. It is to intensify prayer, to, to engage in prayer with uncommon persistence, you know, hunger reminds you to pray, to pray and to pray more and more and more. I have said it here before, that when you're fasting, whenever you feel hungry during the day and you're fasting, the first thought is not, hey, Victoria, what time are you going to cook supper today? What time are you going to cook lunch today? Can you cook it at six instead of seven? Uh, normally we eat at seven or six. Can you cook it at eight instead of nine? Normally we eat at nine or eight. Can you cook it at ten instead of this time? Uh, what time are we eating? No, the hunger reminds you to pray. Oh, why am I hungry? I am hungry because I am praying. Oh, what am I praying for? I am praying for this item on my prayer list. I'm praying for this person or this idea. So hunger does that. It helps us to intensify our prayers. Another reason is that we fast to get God's direction. We have already seen that from the early church. They want to know, how should I advance? Sometimes you want to know that, God, what shall I do? You are employed somewhere, you have a really good job, you love it, and another opportunity presents itself. You are a missionary here in Uganda, another opportunity presents itself somewhere else, and the Lord brings it before you, and you're starting to think, what should I do? Should I stay here? Should I go to that other place? Spend time and, and fast and pray for God's direction. You're thinking, what should I do in a situation which I have no clarity about? Do that. Fast and pray. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said he spoke and gave them direction. We fast number, why should you fast number seven? As part of regular Christian life. To simply grow your spiritual life. To just say, I'm going to stay away from food today. I'm going to spend more time in prayer or other good works or community outreach. I'm going to reach out to more people. I'm going to think more about my life. I'm going to think more about my life and my work with the Savior. So I'm going to abstain from food so that I can, I can clear my mind to think about this. Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting. For him it was regular spiritual life until this hour and then at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. That text in 1 Corinthians 7 written directly to couples says that, that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer. Lastly, why you should fast, number eight, is that uncommon power of the Holy Spirit comes down during sincere, true, genuine fasting. Uncommon power. The Holy Spirit sends at that time. In Matthew chapter 17, for example, at the healing of the diseased demon-oppressed boy, the disciples couldn't cast out the demon. And they asked Jesus, when Jesus comes, why couldn't we do it? Jesus says, because of your unbelief. This kind does not come out but by two things, but by prayer and fasting. Uncommon power, the unusual power, not regular everyday kind of power. 
The disciples in the upper room were very timid, closed up together. They, they have seen persecution. Jesus has been killed. He's resurrected. He's gone. They are timid at that point. And then the Holy Spirit is given to the church at Pentecost. And there is uncommon power. So we pray so that uncommon power and fast so that uncommon power of the Holy Spirit comes during sincere, true, genuine praying with fasting. So those are eight reasons why you should fast. Finally, number four, when? When should you fast? I know this feels more of a teaching than a preaching, right? When should you fast? At, 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 is it during the day? Is it during the night? Is it the first month of the year? Is it the middle of the year? Is it the last month of the year? <laughs> When should I fast? Is it when I want? Is it when someone wants? Is it when the church has said we have 21 days of prayer? When should I fast? Well, the Bible has not left us without a witness on when we should fast. Eight times when you should fast before appointing leaders of a local church. It's no easy thing appointing leaders of a local church, a pastor, elders, we pray, we fast, we seek the Lord for his will regarding that. And we say, God, are these people that you want to be leaders of this church? So the early church did in Acts chapter 14 and verse 23. They ordained them elders in every church and prayed with fasting. When should you fast? Number two, when you're going through mourning. David loved Jonathan. You look at the Bible there is only one friendship that is real that you find in the Bible that is remarkable, that is outstanding. You know, it's very hard to find a good friend. You know that. Not even a good friend. I've removed the adjective. To just find a friend and you say, this person is my friend, that is, that is as rare as finding an egg from a cow. It is very rare. David and Jonathan had that kind of a friendship. David respected Saul because he was the anointed of God. But when both died, what did David do? He said, let people mourn and weep and fast until evening for Saul and Jonathan, his son, and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they were fallen by the sword. Whenever you find yourself going through mourning, for some reason, it's a good time to fast. And in a way, it goes hand in hand. Morning with fasting. When should you fast? Um, number three. Ugh. Ivan. Okay. There. When should you fast? Number three. In view of God's judgment. When Jonah was sent to go and tell Nineveh, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. The people of Nineveh turned from their wickedness. They believed God and proclaimed a fast, and they put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word had come to them that destruction is coming. Sometimes you feel, you sense there is God's judgment looming in view of God's judgment in one way or the other. That's a good time to spend in fasting, in praying, in seeking God. Number four, when should you fast? In distressful, difficult, dark, deep situations. Here is Daniel in captivity. He doesn't know the will of God. He is seeking for it. He wants to know what God wants for his people. He reads the Bible, the scriptures. Then in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 2, the Lord brings him to mind about the years of captivity and how God had spoken about them to Jeremiah. And what David does, uh, sorry, what Daniel does is that he sets his face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And he made his prayer to God, to God. So sometimes you find yourself in those situations. They are deep, they are dark, they're distressful, they are difficult. What shall I do? This is what you shall do. To intensify your prayers, you can fast. You can fast. Number five, when you sense or realize that things are not right with your spiritual walk with the Lord. Did I skip something? 
or story of Esther, who said, gather all the Jews and tell them to pray and to declare a fast. I'm going to see the king, and if I perish, I perish. Number six, when you sense or realize that things are not right in your walk with the Lord, in your spiritual life, sometimes you have that sense, you have that feel, you know, things are just not right with me. I don't know why. Maybe you are struggling to pray or you're struggling to go to church or you're struggling to give. You're struggling in your relationship with your husband or wife or children. Your job is, you know, everyone knows when something is not right in my heart. Something is not right in my spiritual life. In Joshua chapter 7, after the fall of Jericho, the Israelites went against a city, a small city called Ai. It didn't have a lot of people. It should have been, so to speak, a walkover. But they were thoroughly beaten and defeated. And Joshua and the elders wonder, well, how? How? What happened? How did we get to this point? Haven't we been walking well with the Lord? They analyze themselves. They take stock. They evaluate themselves and they see there has to be some problem. Why would God allow this to us? Have we disobeyed him? And then the Lord revealed to them that there was someone who had committed evil in that particular camp. His name was Achan. So, when you sense or realize that things are not right in your walk with the Lord, when should you fast? Number eight, out of realization of a severe or serious or major sinful condition or a particular sin that so easily entangles you. Sometimes there is that one sin that just, that just follows you, that just follows you and you haven't come to the place of victory over it. Or sometimes there are thoughts that, that Satan brings up from your past or, or, or issues that you have done or mistakes that you have committed or shortcomings you've had, and it's just there and it's there and it's there and it's there every time. Or maybe it's one severe, serious sin that you have committed and you know as a child of God you have committed it. What shall I do first? So they did in First Samuel chapter 7. They so disobeyed the God that the Ark of the Covenant was taken by the Philistines. And so they gathered themselves at Mizpeh and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said this, we have sinned against the Lord. That is confession. You wonder what confession is? It is right there. It is right there in the book of Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 12, when Nathan approached David and told David of his sin. David said, I have sinned against the Lord. No excuse, no justification. Not he made me do it, she made me do it, it made me do it. No, I have sinned against the Lord. Confession is agreeing with God that we have sinned. And sometimes you realize that you have sinned in one particular way or a particular sin follows you. Lastly, when should you fast to discern the voice and the call of God? The Lord may call some of you here to the work of full-time ministry as, as a missionary, as a pastor, as an evangelist. I certainly pray for that, that God would raise up men from among us who the church can support to go to, to a Bible school who can be pastors, who will plant other One Life churches wherever that is, who will advance the gospel as missionaries in other countries, in the region of East Africa, in the continent of Sub-Saharan Africa, in Western Mediterranean, which I don't think is in Africa, in Europe, in Asia, in Australia, in North America, in South America, in Southeast Asia, wherever that could be, that the Lord would send and bring forth missionaries from this very church and pastors. We are told that Saul was three days without sight and three days did, did he neither eat nor drink. Immediately after his call to the ministry, perhaps he fasted to his to be healed from his physical blindness. Now, having his spiritual eyes opened, he's physically blind. Perhaps he fasted as a response to his spiritual madness, and he was expressing a genuine internal repentance for his murder and persecution of God's people. Therefore, when you want to think about praying and fasting, there is much more than I have displayed on the screen that you can say or think about. But that's a good way to go about it. Think about what prayer is, what the Bible says, why you should fast, and even when you should fast.